two. Good morning, St. Augustine Road Baptist Church. Uh, this is a Sunday school hour, and uh, we are going to be looking in the book of Luke uh, today. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 7, and we're going to start there. Uh, before we get started, we're going to pray a little bit, because uh, we can't do anything without prayer. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your good grace and mercy. And Lord, we just ask you to watch over everyone out there today. Lord, uh, we know that all this coronavirus is going on and, and people are just freaking out all over the world, Lord. So, but Lord, one thing I've noticed is that Christians have been calm. Christians have been calm and they've been uh, uh, not too worried about this because we know that you're in control, Lord. So Father, I just ask you to just help us to... Uh, through this ordeal, Lord, and, and Lord, just direct and guide us in the way that you would have us to go. And I do want to lift up Miss Bobby and, and Brother uh, Rocky uh, for the passing of Brother Wayne. And Lord, we just lift them up and lift up that family to you, Father. We just ask you to put a hedge around them at this time and comfort them. And Lord, be with all those in our congregation that are sick and uh, dealing with uh, illnesses and surgeries and hospital recoveries and Lord we just lift them all up to you today Father we ask you to just join us now in your word Father we ask that you would just speak to each one of our hearts today Lord I do thank you I ask you to just set me aside Lord let your word and spirit speak to us and Father if there's one out there that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior Father I pray that you would draw them to your son Jesus Christ for it's in him that we have salvation and it's in him that we have peace so, Father, we thank you now, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, we're looking in uh, Luke chapter 7. We're going to be looking at five different people in, in this, uh, in this uh, chapter here. And, and I want you to think about this. Uh, we're going to be looking at motives, why people come to Jesus. Uh, what is some of the motives uh, that why people would come to Jesus? Uh, first off, we're going to be looking at a centurion uh, soldier. Uh, this takes place in the book of Capernaum. And uh, a little later on, we're going to get to a story. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But let's look at this right now. Hopefully, I won't run too many rabbit trails. All right? It says, uh, now, when he had entered all, now when he had ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to, unto him, was sick and ready to die. So we see that this centurion, sir, this centurion soldier has a servant, and he's real dear to him, and he's getting ready to die. So right away we get this, this uh, centurion's motive, and his motive is to help a friend. Uh, he's, he wants to get in touch with Jesus to help his friend uh, that he might heal him so he doesn't die. It says in verse 2, it says, And a certain centurion servant, uh, who, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, uh, he sent unto him elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when he came to Jesus, or when they came to Jesus, uh, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy uh, for whom he should do this. Uh, for he loved our nation, and he had built us a synagogue. So uh, we see that this centurion servant uh, was partial to the Jewish people, built them a synagogue, and, and so now he sent the, the, the uh, elders to come to Jesus. Verse 6, he says, and Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far away from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Man, there's some faith right there. Uh, this centurion servant, we see how, uh, we see his humbleness, that he's not worthy to come to Jesus, or he doesn't feel like he's worthy to come to Jesus. He doesn't feel like Jesus, uh, he's worthy for Jesus to enter into his house. And so he had sent elders, he had sent friends to Jesus, and, and he finally said, Lord, all you got to do is just say the word. Just say the word and I know my servant will be healed. Verse 8, he says, For I am a man 
uh, set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and unto another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and he turned him about, turning the, the friends about that brought the message, and said unto the people that followed Jesus, said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And, and, they, and they that were sent returned to the house, uh, finding the servant whole that had been sick. Uh, and so we see that, that in this, this man coming to Jesus by faith, sending his friends, sending the elders uh, to Jesus uh, by faith, uh, that, that, that just speak the word. You know, speak the word. He said that, that I'm a man of authority. I know that you have great authority. You have authority over distance. You have authority over healing. You have authority to, uh, your word is, is authoritative. He said, all you got to do is just say the word and I know he'll be healed. So we see that his motive it, it was to help a friend and he came by faith. That's important. He came by faith. Let's look at the next one now in verse 11. It says, and, and it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And Min, now Nain is, to give you a little history here, Nain is, is in the southernmost portion of Galilee. Uh, Capernaum is, you have the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum would be up on the northwest corner. Uh, and uh, uh, Nain would be all the way down past the Sea of Galilee almost into the, the next territory there, into Samaria, but uh, uh, it's right there on the southernmost edge of Galilee. So we see that Jesus is working his way down toward Jerusalem, it looks like. So anyway, he says, uh, Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city were with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. We see that we have these two masses of people coming together at the city gate. Those that were following Jesus and those that were following the funeral procession. And they met there at the gate. And now uh, Jesus saw this woman, knows in his heart, because Jesus knows all things, knows that this is her only son knows that she's a widow, knows that she's all by herself, all alone, and Jesus had compassion on her. Uh, he said that uh, he came up to her and he told her, weep not. Uh, verse uh, 14, he says, and he came and touched the buyer, which is the open coffin, came and touched the buyer, and they that bare him stood still. So the, the pallbearers, they stood still. Uh, it's always good when people stand still around Jesus. You know, when Jesus comes around, people stand still. And, and that's a good thing because when, when people stand still and Jesus has the floor, things are going to happen. Amen? Amen. Look at what he says. He says, And he said unto the young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And, and he that was dead set up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. So we see that, that, uh, that this woman, she has no expectations. Look at this. She, she comes with no expectations. She comes with no motives. Uh, she didn't even know Jesus was going to be there. She was coming to bury her son and then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. He shows up and he sees her and he has compassion on her. You know, uh, that's just like Jesus. To just show up in the time of need. You know, whenever there's a need, Jesus can show up. Uh, he, he, he can come and, and he can touch us. And, and we want to be touched by Jesus. If you've never felt the touch of Christ, man, you're missing out. I'm telling you, if you're in a, a situation that's out of your control, uh, just like this coronavirus, you know, people are, are, are just worried about this all over, but I see in Christians, they're not worried because we know Jesus. And we know that Jesus is, is in control of all things. He created all things. So it's nothing for Him to raise the dead. 
It's nothing for him to get us through this uh, uh, virus, through this illness. You know, the Bible tells us in, in Revelation that, that, and in, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 24, these are birth pains we're going through. You know, there's coming a day when the church is going to be raptured out and, and God's going to pour out his wrath upon this world and all those who rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And these are just birth pains. This is just the beginning. You know, church is going to be gone. And when we're gone, man, it's going to be, it's going to be hell on earth. And, and if they're freaking out now, just imagine how they're going to be in that day. Amen. Look at this. Now, we see that this woman had no expectation. She was grieving. She was coming to bury her, her son. And, and Jesus shows up. No motives. And, and he t talks to her, says, weep not. Goes over, touches the coffin. You know, uh, I'm sure the Pharisees in the town were watching this and they're like, oh, he's unclean because he just touched the coffin. He touched the dead body, you know. But he comes over to the young man. That just shows you that, that this all these man-made laws and rules uh, that men set out, that religion set out, they mean nothing to Jesus. You know, Jesus goes by what's in this book right here. And, 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 and he wrote this book. So we know that, that, that he's going to hold to that and not the, not the religion of men. But we see that this young man, he arose and he sat up in that coffin he, and started to speak. And Jesus brought him to his mother, delivered him to his mother. And like I said, no expectations, no motives. Uh, and I'm sure that she had great faith after Jesus passed by her. You know, uh, that's the thing. You know, we can come to church and you might come to church, you might be lost, but man, Jesus comes by your pew one day and he kind of touches you and he, he, he tells you to weep not, to be of good courage. And man, the next thing you know, you're hitting the altar, giving your heart to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's my Lord right there. That's my Lord. Amen. Well, let's look at this next one now. Uh, this next one we're seeing... Uh, uh, John the Baptist here. Now, John the Baptist, he's in jail at this time. And uh, his faith is not wavering. You know, we might read this story here and we might think that his faith is wavering. Uh, we might think that, uh, uh, that you know, uh, he's doubting, but he's not. Just get that out of your mind. He's not. John saw Jesus when Jesus came there uh, in the Jordan to be baptized. John is, this is the very John that said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. This is the same John that saw the dove descend from heaven and light upon Jesus. And the Lord had spoken to John saying, When you see the Holy Spirit descend and come upon this, you'll know this is He. Uh, you'll know that this is the man. But we see here that John in prison, uh, we're seeing that he just wanting a reassurance. You know, when we're going through a time of testing, when we're going through a time of, uh, 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 of just, uh, just heavy burden upon us, we want reassurance. You know, and we can get reassurance from the Word of God. And that's what John was looking for. Let's look at this in verse 18. It says, And the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or, or look we for another? Uh, when the men were come unto Jesus, they said that John the Baptist has sent them unto him uh, uh, to say, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? See, John's wanting reassurance. You know, John's locked away in this dungeon. He's out of touch with everybody, kind of like how we are now. You know, we're, we're locked down. Uh, some of us locked down, can't leave our houses, you know, uh, for all this stuff that's going on. We want reassurance. We want reassurance that everything's going to be all right. We want reassurance that, that John is wanting reassurance that, hey, you are the one. I know that you are. My faith is not wavering, but I just want reassurance, and I want to reassure my disciples that are with me that, hey, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the one that we were looking for. Uh, so we see in verse 20 and verse uh, 21, he says, And in that same hour, he being Jesus, he cured many uh, of their infirmities and plagues and, and of evil spirits 
and unto many that were bound or that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, to the disciples, uh, John's disciples, Go your way and tell John that what these things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, who, he who, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John had departed, Jesus, or he, began to speak unto the people concerning John. We see that, that, that in this, when Jesus sent those disciples away and he told them, tell John what you've seen. Tell John how the, how the lame are healed, the blind can see, the, the deaf can speak. Uh, uh, I mean, the deaf can hear, the, the, the dumb can speak, the lame can walk. Uh, the lepers are cleansed. Uh, the gospel has been preached to the poor. Those that sat in darkness. He said, tell John that. And that will be the reassurance that John needs uh, when, when he comes to him. And, and reassures him in prison that, hey, I am he. You don't need to look for another. We see that uh, when these messengers left, John, or Jesus started to speak about John. He asked the people that were there with him, those of Jesus' disciples and those that followed him and all of those who had gathered at Capernaum, uh, or not Capernaum, but in uh, name, he, he started to speak to the, these two crowds. And he says, uh, and when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out uh, for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in the king's court. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. To... All right, he said, a prophet, yea, I say unto you, much more than a prophet. John the Baptist, he was more than a prophet because he was a forerunner to Jesus. I mean, he was the one that, that was uh, spoken of by Isaiah, where he says, uh, uh, the one crying in the wilderness, uh, the one that prepares the way of the Lord uh, to make the path straight. You know, uh, uh, so, so we see that Jesus saying, yeah, he's a prophet, but he's much more than a prophet. Verse 27, he says, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those uh, that are born of women, there is none greater, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Man, what does he mean by that? Think about this now. We're in the kingdom of God. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that's with us every day. If you've been born again, the Spirit of God indwells you. He didn't indwell John. He would come upon the prophets of old, but we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. That's why he's saying there that, that, that the least of you are, are, are greater than John the Baptist because the God, Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. He directs you. He guides you. You know, uh, we listen to him, and, and he's gonna he's gonna let us know when we're veering off course. You know, uh, we can grieve and we can quench him, but we don't want to do that because if we're if we're walking with the Lord and we're in the will of God, you know, when we start to veer off, the Holy Spirit's gonna let us know. Hey, you need to get back in line here. You know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go that direction. That's gonna lead you down a trail you don't want to go. You know, that's what sin does. Sin, sin that, what's what the old saying? It says sin uh, costs us more than we want to pay. It'll take us uh, where we don't want to go and it'll keep us longer than we want to stay. I mean, it, we don't want to go that way. And that's what the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So he says, he says, but he that is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans uh, justified God 
being baptized with the baptism of John. Now look at this now. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of John. You know, John was, he was baptizing unto repentance. Alright? So those that would agree with God, which were publicans and sinners, they were being baptized. They were coming and getting baptized, repenting of their sins, being baptized of John in, in the Jordan. But those of the Pharisees, the religious crowd, uh, the Pharisees and the, the lawyers and the Sadducees and all that bunch, you know, they don't want no part of John. You know, John was a wild man. He's out there, you know, eating locusts and honey and wearing uh, camel skin and, and wearing a leather belt. And I mean, he was living on the land, you know. They, they want somebody separate, but, but then when he comes along, they reject him. You know, we're going to see right here where it talks about Jesus. You know, Jesus came uh, being a friend of sinners. And, and let's look what they called him, man. Look at this in verse 31. It says, And, and the Lord said, Where aren't you then shall I liken these men of this generation? And to what are they like? Uh, they are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, playing a game here, saying, We have piped and you have not, you have not danced. You know, we're playing the music, but you're not dancing. Uh, he says that, uh, that we, we mourn for you, but you haven't wept. You know, we're doing our part, but hey, you're not doing your part. That's what these Pharisees and these lawyers are, you know. Uh, John said, hey, I've come baptizing unto repentance, but they won't repent. So Jesus says, hey, I like them, liken them unto children playing in the marketplace uh, that where we're, we piped and we played the music, but they're not dancing. It says, uh, we, we're, we're mourning with you, uh, but you haven't wept. You know, you're, and look what he says in verse 33. It says, for John the Baptist came neither eating, drinking, ne neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and they said that he had the devil. All right, he comes as a separated life, lead, leading a separated life, and they're saying, man, this guy's got a devil. And then Jesus comes along. Look at this in verse 34. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. You know, uh, with these Pharisees, you can't win. That's how it is with the religious crowd. You can't win. You know, uh, you, if you do good, they're saying, Oh, you're this. Or, and if you do bad, you're saying, Oh, well, he's that. You know, so, I mean, it's a no win situation. They're the only ones that are righteous. Everybody else is a sinner. You know? So we see that, that, that when Jesus was talking to these people, he was explaining to them about John the Baptist. And he's, he's giving some insight on himself, too, uh, when he's saying there in verse 34. You know, uh, Jesus is a friend of sinners. I say, thank you, Lord. I'm thankful that he's a friend of sinners because I are one. You know? So I, I, I'm glad that Jesus is a friend of sinners because. Uh, he loves us. You know, he said that I'll leave the 99 and I'll go after that one. You know, his, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, motive of, op or of operation was to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and so that's what Jesus does. He seeks and he saves that which was lost. Look at verse 35. In 35, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21 through 24. He says, in verse 35, it says, By wisdom is justified of all her children. Look at, look at this in, verse, in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21 uh, through 24. Really, it's all of that, that, that chapter right there, or that uh, beginning of that chapter, but we just want to look at this one, one section here. 1 Corinthians 1, it says, uh, starting in verse 21, uh, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jew require a sign, and the Greeks seek, seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Greek foolishness. But unto them which are called, 
both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, for all those who are born again, we know that Christ is the power of God. We know that Christ is the wisdom of God. Therefore, the verse says, but wisdom is justified of all her children. All those who are born again are, are the children of wisdom because they have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, in this last section, uh, which, man, I know I'm talking fast, and uh, uh, hopefully we're going to get through with all this. I think we will. Now, in this last story, this story is similar uh, to another story that you can find in John 12, 1 through 11, in Mark 14, 1 through 11, and in Matthew 26, 6 through 13. It's a similar story, but it's totally different. That story takes place in Bethany at the time of six days before the Passover uh, when Jesus is going to be crucified. Uh, some of the characters are the same, or not the same, but, but similar. Uh, as we're going to see, there's a, that takes place in Bethany uh, in Simon the leper's house. And also, uh, Mary was the one that anointed uh, Jesus uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the ointment. Uh, and Mary being uh, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And uh, she had done that for his burial. But this is a different situation, different town. This is still in Nain, uh, in southern Galilee. So uh, the stories, you, you can get them confused. But I just wanted to point that out to you. That that's a whole separate story. Uh, and if you want to go and study that, look through those three verses. John 12, 1 through 11. Mark 14. 1 through 11, and Matthew 26, 6 through 13, because each one of those stories you pick up a little more information, and there, it's the same story about the same event. But this is a different event. Now this event takes place, like I said, in Nain, and we're going to look at two people here. We're going to look at a Pharisee, and we're going to look at a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Uh, we're going to see their two motives for coming to Jesus. Uh, we see that, that this Pharisee, let's read this. This is Simon the Pharisee, and he's of the synagogue of Nain uh, there in, in uh, southern uh, Galilee. It says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would come and eat with him. Now that word desired means, uh, check this out, this kind of gives us some insight on his motives. All right, because... Uh, his motives, he has, he has contempt for Jesus. All right, this Pharisee does. And we'll find that out a little bit in the story. Uh, but we see that, uh, that he has contempt for Jesus. And, and by him desiring that Jesus would come eat with him uh, in his house, uh, we get a little insight here. That word desired, it means to interrogate by implying to request, to call, it means inquiry, it means to seek, it means to investigate, to search. So we get a kind of an a insight on his motives that he wants to kind of fill Jesus out. He wants to kind of either, uh, 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 either you know, find, try to entrap Jesus or, or try to uh, accuse him of something. You know, we just heard him, Jesus, this Simon the Pharisee, just heard Jesus speaking uh, about himself saying that, that the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and yea, he say, uh, Behold a gluttonous man, and, and behold a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind that this Pharisee, he wants to see firsthand. Is Jesus, uh, uh, is, he, is, he, is he what these people think of him? You know, uh, you know, John the Baptist, he was separated, came, they said he had a devil. So, you know, he don't know what to think of Jesus at this point. So I think he's, he's, he's coming to try to entrap Jesus, trying to, trying to fill him out, trying to accuse him of something, uh, because Pharisees are always trying to accuse us of something, uh, whether it be church members or, or Jesus or, or anybody. I mean, they're always wanting to accuse somebody of something because they think, like I said, they're holier than thou. They're, they're the righteous bunch. And we're just all a bunch of deplorables, you know. So anyway, let's look at what it says here. It says, it says and he went. So Jesus went, you know. That's, that's the thing I love about Jesus. 
Jesus, he, he's not a respecter of persons. You know, he, he'll go to anybody. He'll go to the leper. He'll go to the lame. He'll go to the sinner. He'll go to the publicans, the religious man's house. He'll go anywhere and, and, and because he knows that he's going to change people's lives if they want to be changed. Uh, so he goes, he says, and, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to me. And then in verse 37, he says, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with their tears, and, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them uh, with ointment. And look at the Pharisee. Here, here he goes. He says, Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now this is a woman on the street. She's probably a prostitute. And so uh, this Pharisee says, Man, if, if he were a prophet, he would know who it was that touched him. You know, he would know what kind of woman this was. And look at this now, Jesus. Jesus knows all things. He hears Simon's heart, what Simon's saying in verse 40. He says, And Jesus answering and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. <laughs> I love that. You know, Simon speaking in his own heart, saying, Man, if this guy were a prophet, he would know who it was that was touching him. Now, he would know what kind of woman this woman was. And Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. I want you to see, first of all, look at this now. Look at this woman. She comes, first of all, she's a woman of the street, all right? So she knows that coming to the Pharisee's house, man, that took great courage on her part because he's a Pharisee. You know, and she's just an old common woman of the street. And look what he says. He says, Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus said at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of, an, of ointment. So, man, when she knew where Jesus was, boom, by faith, she came. It didn't matter where, whose house he was in. It didn't matter where he was. She wanted to get to Jesus. You know, uh, it reminds me of the, the, the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. Man, she fought through the crowds. She reached over. She just touched the hem of his garment. And man, she was healed. Jesus stopped and said, somebody touched me. His disciples said, Master, man, you're in all these throngs of people. Everybody's touching me. He said, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. Somebody got something from me. Got some healing from me. And that's how, that's how I think about this woman here, man. She comes with, a, she, she's got one thing on her mind, to repent. She's coming by faith with repentance in her heart and, and on her mind. Look at this now, I want you to see this. Look at, what, how, look at the position of her. It says in verse 38, she stood at his feet behind him weeping and, and, and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. So we see that that I mean the woman's hair in the Jewish in the Jewish uh, 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 custom. Look in look in First Corinthians eleven fifteen. First Corinthians eleven fifteen, and we'll see what uh, the woman's hair uh, has to her. All right, 1 Corinthians 11, 15. Let's look at this. Now, this is, this is talking about a woman's hair because a woman's hair in, the Jewish, in the, the Jewish economy was her glory, all right? Look at what it says in verse 15 of uh, 1 Corinthians 11. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is, giving, is given her for a covering, all right? So we see that, that you know, we see all over in the Middle East how, how women are they're always wearing a, a veil over their heads and stuff. Well, to have a, a shaved head or, or to have short hair, 
uh, like that in, in that custom, uh, that was that was uh, a shame to them. But to have long hair, it was a covering to them. It was it was their glory. You know, that's like when uh, when an invading country would come in, that'd be the first thing they would do. They would cut the men's beards. They would shave their heads. They would shave the women's head uh, just to degrade them and, and downgrade them. But we see that, that that's her hair. I mean, her hair, that's her glory. And look what she's doing. With look at the humility here. The brokenness and the humility of this woman. It says that, that she began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet. Now over in the, over in the Middle East, over in that culture, if you were to show the, the bottom of your foot to somebody, that was a total insult. Remember, remember when George Bush was over there uh, and he was speaking and the guy is on a news press conference and the guy took his shoe off and threw it at him. And he said, oh, it looked like a size 11 or something like that. He made a comment kind of playing it off. But that was an insult, you know, because uh, the shoe or the foot, you know, any part of that is, it, 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 that's because in that culture, when you're walking around, your feet are getting dirty. So, I mean, your feet are, are, are constantly being dirty. Remember when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet? And, and, and he came to Peter, and Peter said, you know, because he's puffed up with pride, he came to Je Jesus, came to Peter, and he said, he goes, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? He goes, you'll not wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. And he said, Lord, not my feet only, but my head and everything. And he said, all I need to do is wash your feet because you're clean everywhere. Uh, so, so the feet, that plays an important role, you know, uh, washing the feet. And uh, uh, we see that this woman, man, she, she's crying her tears, washing Jesus' feet, wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet, and anointing them with ointment. And, and we saw what uh, the Pharisee Simon said. Let's look down in verse 40 and 41. It says, And Jesus answered and said in his heart, or said unto him, I'm sorry, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. He said, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 uh, pence and, and the other 50. And when they had, and when they had need, nothing to pay, uh, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gave me, gave me no kiss, you know, uh, that's, that's the custom. They would greet people with a kiss. He didn't, he didn't give Jesus any water to wash his feet. That was an insult. You know, that would be like somebody coming over to your house and, and you not asking to take their coat. You know, uh, you're just like, oh, keep your coat on because you ain't staying long. You know? <laughs> so it's kind of it's an insult. You know, so he's like, you know, he said, didn't give Jesus any, any water to wash his feet. And, and Jews weren't allowed to wash people's feet. That was that was the job of a, of a slave to do that. You know, uh, that's why it was such a big deal with Jesus being the master washed the disciples' feet. You know, uh, that's why Peter was like, "Hey, what, what you gonna wash my feet? You know, you're you're the master. You're not a servant." But that's a different story. But anyway, we see that that he didn't give Jesus any water to wash his feet. He didn't give him a kiss. It said in verse 45, Thou gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I have came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And he said in verse 46, My head with oil thou did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Now, here, here's the rest of that crowd, that Pharisaical crowd there. Look at them. And they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, you notice how nobody ever says anything out loud to Jesus. 
They're always talking under their breath or in their, into their self, you know. They're always speaking in their self. He hears us. He knows us. I mean, I'm going to show you something in just a second. Let me show you right now. Look at, uh, look, this is a rabbit trail. And my class knows that I'm noted for rabbit trails. Look, I was studying the other day, and uh, that's one thing, having some time, uh, having some time off, time to myself, I've been able to study for myself. Uh, and I was studying in, uh, in uh, uh, Malachi. Turn the book of Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. That'll be easy to remember. 3.16, John 3.16, Malachi 3.16. Look at what this says in, uh, in uh, Malachi 3.16. That's right before Matthew, if you've forgotten where it was. I almost did. Let me turn it over here. Malachi 3.16. Look at this. Did you know there's a book of remembrance that God keeps? Look at this. In Malachi 3.16, it says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkeneth and heareth it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that, and that, though, and, oh, I can't read, and the Lord, uh, and they, and, and that thought upon his name, or that thought upon his name. Man, I couldn't get it out there. Look at what it says. It says, a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon His name. So every time we have a conversation, you know the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. Well, wherever two or three are gathered and talking about Jesus, it's being written down. It's being written down. Everything said, everything thought, being written down in a book of remembrance. You know, when you get to the... Uh, uh, you know, I love that, that, that man... All of our thoughts are about Jesus are written down in a book. You know, uh, he can look at it at any time. He knows them everything. I mean, he knows from the beginning to the end. But I mean, it's it's nice to have like, oh, let's see what was said about me on on uh, March second, uh, two thousand five. You know, he can look back in the book and see everything that we had a conversation. About. But we see that, that these Pharisees there and all these people that are gathered around, they're saying within themselves, look at what it says uh, in verse 49, and they, and they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? You know? Who does he think he is? Who is this guy? You know? That's why that's why Simon wanted him to come there. He wanted to find out a little more about Jesus, find out what, you know, what, what, who is this guy? You know, he already said if he was a prophet, so he doesn't think that he's a prophet. We know that he he, he has a, a contempt for Jesus because he didn't give him any water to wash his feet, didn't give him a kiss when he came in. I mean, he didn't do any of the normal customs of greeting uh, when he came in. You know, he just said, "Come in, sit down." You know, he didn't do anything. Didn't anoint his head with oil. Didn't anoint his feet. Didn't do anything. Uh, but we see that that he shows. His contempt for Jesus and, and the lack of stuff that he didn't do. You know, uh, look what he says there in verse 50. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. So this woman, not only did she come, I mean, I want you to see these three things here. She came, faith brought her to Jesus. All right? She knew where he was, she had to get there. Her faith brought her to Jesus. Humility and brokenness led her to repentance. You know, she repented of her sins and love is a reason for her service. I mean, love is a reason for her actions of her uh, kissing Jesus' feet, washing His feet, wiping them with her hair. All that was done out of love. So we see some of the motives of, of why people come to Jesus. We saw that, that a lot of the motives had faith to do with them. The centurion. By faith, he came, sent people to Jesus to heal his friend. You know, it wasn't, uh, it was for him indirectly, but it was mainly uh, to heal his friend, to heal his servant, uh, because it, he, he thought a lot of it. The widow named, she had no expectations. She had no motive. She, would, she just happened to be there, and man, she got her son back, you know, and I'm sure that she believed on Jesus after that. 
Uh, I mean, how could you not? He raised the dead. Uh, we see that, that John the Baptist, by faith, sent his, his, his uh, disciples uh, to go and, and for reassurance for, for them and for him. Uh, that reassurance that yes, Jesus is the one. So by faith, he sent and, and with reassurance. We see that Simon, he had no faith. Simon, he, he, was content, he had contempt for Jesus. You know, uh, he, he, he didn't respect Jesus. You know, he, he, he was just a Pharisee. What more can you say? But the woman, she had the right, she had the right motives. She had the right intent because she, faith, hope, and love brought her to Jesus. Faith brought her to Jesus. Humility and brokenness led her to repentance. Love is the reason for her service. And that's why we should come to Jesus. Amen. Uh, let's uh, close in prayer. And uh, we'll hope y'all had a good time and hope uh, the Lord blessed you. Uh, I know I stumbled and bumbled through a reading of it here, but uh, that's what I do sometimes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your good grace and mercy. And we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that, that, that all my nonsense would set aside, Lord, and that the Word and the Spirit would, would touch people's hearts. Father God, we just thank you. We ask you to just continue to do a work on us, Lord. Continue to bless us. And Lord, only you can bring us together by keeping us separate. Lord God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all.